George from Mist and Stone. Welcome to the channel. Here we produce content of a history nostalgia bent generally. If you like what we're producing or what, what we um, are setting out to offer, please like, subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll get notified when um, we bring out some new videos. And subscribing to the channel doesn't cost you anything and it helps us immensely develop and push forward the channel. If you subscribe by the way, um, drop a message underneath and say hi and we'll say hello to you back and maybe find out a little bit about what you'd like to see on the channel. Although we in Ireland are a little island on the most westerly outskirts of Europe, we do hold our own when it comes to adding to the culture and well-being of the world. In this video we won't be looking at literature, art or music, they are videos in themselves. Here we look at innovations, world changing innovations of which this island has created more than its fair share. Here are some amazing Irish inventions that had a global impact. But before we begin, a little disclaimer. Another thing we Irish are great at is nitpicking, I do it myself. So when I produced this list in written form some time ago, it was pointed out to me that most of the people in it were in fact West Brits, pillars of the establishment in Ireland. So for clarity I'll point out, historically most innovations come from the artisan or ruling class. The working class being for the most part illiterate and struggling to live. If I made this list and left out Guinness, spoiler I haven't, you, you would think it's incomplete, but well, Lord Ivy was certainly not a peasant. If someone was born on the island of Ireland, they are, for the purposes of this list at least, Irish, no matter which part of the island they were born on or what their tradition or allegiance. If someone's not born on this island, they're not. So I haven't included people born elsewhere who identify as having Irish heritage. The first maternity hospital in the world was founded in 1745 by Bartholomew Moss a surgeon and midwife. The Rotunda is the oldest continuously running maternity hospital in the world. Moss was appalled at the conditions that pregnant women had to endure in George's Lane in March 1745. The Rotunda Hospital, legally the hospital for the relief of poor lying in women Dublin, is a maternity hospital on Parnell Street in Dublin, now managed by the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland Hospitals. It was granted by Royal Charter on the 2nd of December 1756 by King George II. Lying in is an archaic term for childbirth, referring to the month-long bed rest prescribed for postpartum confinement in those days. While on the subject of babies, all-round healing wonder goo pseudocrine was invented in the 1930s by Thomas Smith, who called it Smith's Cream. We're not sure whether it was the merciless slagging he got from his immature mates down his local, but for some reason he soon changed his name to Soothing Cream. It's easy to see how that morphed into its present name, Soothing Cream. The lifesavers for babies with sore bottoms and long distance cyclists alike is still produced in Baldoyle in North Dublin. Another staple of growing up in Ireland was milk of magnesia. In 1829, Sir James Murray used a condensed solution of fluid magnesia preparation of his own design to treat the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, the Marquis, the Marquis of Anglesey, for stomach pain. This was so successful it was approved by the Royal College of Surgeons in 1838, and he was appointed resident physician to Anglesey and two subsequent Lord Lieutenants and he was also knighted. His fluid magnesia product was patented two years after his death in 1873. The term milk of magnesia was first used by Charles Henry Phillips in 1872 for a suspension of magnesium hydroxide. It was sold under the brand name Phillips Milk of Magnesia for medical usage. The hypodermic syringe was invented by Francis Rind in 1844. Francis Rind, a Dublin doctor, performed the world's first subcutaneous injection with his homemade hypodermic syringe. 
Rind had been treating a woman who had pain in her face for years and was taking morphine pills without any relief. Rind decided to place the morphine directly under the skin near the nerves. He created a narrow tube and a cutting implement known as a trocar. Four puncture holes were made and morphine flowed through the tubes and the rest, they say, is history. Another medical implement invented by an Irish man was the binaural stethoscope invented by Arthur Laird in 1851. One of the most important tools in modern medicine, the binaural stethoscope, was invented by a man from the southeast of Ireland. The stethoscope was originally invented in 1819 by a French name named René Lenec. Arthur Laird, a Wexford native, realised that Lenec's instrument could be more effective, so he connected two ear pieces to the listening cylinder with rubber tubes. Laird went on to display the stethoscope at the Great Exhibition in London in 1851 and received critical acclaim. The binaural stethoscope paved the way for the development of the modern stethoscope, worn in many women's fantasies very well by George Clooney and Leo. A cure for leprosy. It was an Irish man who accidentally discovered the cure for leprosy while he was looking for an answer to Ireland's tuberculosis problem. What a lucky mistake. Vincent Barry made his accidental and miraculous discovery with the catchy title of compound B663. This compound would go on to cure 15 million people of this devastating disease. In 1943, Barry returned to Dublin on a fellowship in organic chemistry to work for the Medical Research Council. He researched the chemotherapy of tuberculosis, looking for a cure for TB, which was a significant health issue in Ireland at the time. His work developed instead into an effective treatment for leprosy. Barry worked with the leprosy mission in Zimbabwe and India to develop drugs against tuberculosis and leprosy. From 1950, he led a team of nine scientists at Trinity College. The first synthesized B663 in 1954, and it was launched as an anti-leprosy drug, clofazamine, in 1957. Portable defibrillator. Professor Frank Partridge invented the emergency defibrillator, changing and modernizing emergency medicine in the process. In 1965, the first prototype was installed in a Belfast ambulance. Since then, emergency defibrillators have become an important first aid tool and saved a lot of lives. One of the most famous people to always liked Professor Partridge is Fabrice Munla. In March 2012, he suffered a heart attack during an FA Cup match between Bolton and Tottenham Hotspur. His heart stopped for 78 minutes, but thanks to Professor Partridge's wonder machine, he was able to recover. Now, from saving lives to taking them, we move on to warfare. Um, we Irish weren't slouches when it comes to inventing machines of war. The guided torpedo was invented by Lewis Brennan in 1877. Would you believe that the world's first guided missile originated from Castlebar? Lewis Brennan, a talented engineer from Castlebar, created a directable torpedo that could be controlled by guide wires. The first design of the torpedo was produced when Brennan was 25. He received funding from the British Navy. In 1877, a government factory began producing Brennans in Kent. The Brennan would go on to be used as a defence mechanism by the British Coastal Defence Forces until the early 20th century. However, so far as is known, it was never actually fired in anger. The submarine was invented by John Philip Holland in 1878. It was a rebel from Liscanor, County Clare, who completely changed the way war could be conducted at sea, as well as deep sea exploration. Holland, a school teacher, emigrated to Boston in 1872. His first prototype sank on its launch. However, in 1881, Holland launched the Fenian Ram, funded by the Fenian Brotherhood. It proved to be a success. 
In the following years, Holland won three competitions run by the US Naval Department to design and build submarines. However, political factors meant that this was an unsuccessful venture. Finally, after successful trials, the US Navy purchased the Holland V-2, its first submarine, and proceeded to order six more. The submarine was now a must-have in naval warfare. From the submarine to the tank, which came from Black Rock in Dublin in 1911. Major Walter Gordon Wilson, CMG, was an Irish medical engineer, inventor and member of the British Royal Naval Air Service. He was credited by the 1919 Royal Commission on Awards and Inventions as the co-inventor of the tank, along with Sir William Tritton. When the then Home Secretary in Britain, Winston Churchill, commissioned the design of a vehicle capable of resisting bullets and shrapnel, crossing trenches, flattening barbed wire and negotiating the mud of no man's land, this is what our Dublin boy came up with. The world wars might have been very different without his invention. Though modern tanks might look entirely different to his original designs, the essential battle buggy remains exactly the same. Now I think we've had enough fighting and we'll move on to food and drink. Another thing we Irish like. And of course you can't touch on food and drink without going to the back black stuff. Well maybe it isn't a surprise that we're including Guinness in this. But its popularity and longevity have made it Ireland's most successful and recognisable export. Undoubtedly the most famous Irish export the w throughout the world, drunk around the globe and loved by millions. Arca Guinness began brewing Guinness in Leakslip, County Kildare, before transferring it to St James's Gate Brewery. In 1759 he signed a 9,000 year lease at £45 a year. That's how confident he was in his product. It was originally called Porter because it was loved by the porters in London's Billingsgate Market. Um, and it later became called Stout because it was called Guinness Extra Stout. It's simply known as Guinness now. Another thing um, about Guinness that not many people know is the harp is the symbol of Ireland and is used on all Irish official documents. So nobody is allowed to use the harp as a logo. But Guinness predates the state by a long way and already had the harp as a logo. Um, but the harp on the Guinness faces the opposite way to the official Irish harp that is used on official documents. That's just a little piece of information that not a lot of people knows about Guinness. And now, over 250 years on, it's the best-selling alcoholic drink of all times and boasts sales in excess of two and a half billion. So, if you are coming to Dublin, if you're not a native, if you're a native, you already drink it, no doubt, but if you're coming to Dublin, you should at least try a pint and slant you, which means good health. If alcohol isn't particularly your thing, Another surprising, or more surprising than Guinness actually, Irish person is responsible for is chocolate milk. Chocolate milk is not something that you particularly associate with Ireland. However, the man who first thought of combining these two delicious ingredients was Hans Sloan, noted ph physician and collector who was born and raised in Killalee, County Down. On this, in the 17th century. While studying in Jamaica he noticed the natives mixing cocoa with water and drinking it. He tried to drink and found it nauseating. I think cocoa and water would be fairly nauseating to be honest. But later mixed it with milk instead and found it infinitely more palatable. When he returned to England he brought the recipe with him and sold it to apothecaries as medicine. By the 19th century it had become a confectionery drink made by Cadbury's and everyone has tried it and I doubt that anyone dislikes it. And back to the hard stuff, an apparatus for whiskey distilling. A Dublin chap with a rather exotic name of Anus Coffee K 
came up with the world's first heat exchange device in 1830. This mightn't sound like much, but it's a very efficient little piece of equipment which led to huge advances in distilling whiskey. Whiskey gets its name from Ishka Baha, which was shortened to hit whiskey. And Ishka Baha means the water of life. I certainly wouldn't argue with that. Now, the next item um, invented by an Irish man is actually bound to give you the tours for the two aforementioned Guinness Sour Whiskey. And it's the bacon rasher, which was invented by Henry Den Denny in 1820. It's an essential part of the full Irish or English breakfast. The bacon rasher was invented by Henry Denny, a Waterford butcher. Denny patented several bacon curing techniques and completely reinvented the process of how to cure bacon. Before this, bacon was cured by soaking large chunks of meat in brine. Denny decided to use long, flat pieces of meat instead of chunks and substituted the brine for dry salt. Soon after, Denny began exporting to mainland Europe, the Americas and as far afield as India. The overall quality and shelf life of the bacon was dramatically increased. It was an ingenious but simple innovation for its time. Certainly not as tasty as a bacon rasher, but a staple of many a lunchbox or picnic. The cream cracker was invented by William and R. Jacob in 1885. Um, my own grandfather worked in Jacob's factory at the turn of the century. So not long after really. Like the bacon rasher, the cream cracker was also invented by a Waterford family in the 1800s. In 1885, the Jacobs family produced a biscuit from yeast dough that was left to ferment for 24 hours. It was flattened and then folded numerous times to create a layered biscuit. Jacobs cream crackers that have been a family favourite since their inception are now produced by machines that can create approximately 1 million crackers an hour. Wonder what my grandfather would have thought of that. They're also available to buy in more than 35 countries worldwide. Trinity College professor Robert Percival is the man who invented sparkling water in the 1800s. For some unknown reason, he initially thought it would be a cure for scurvy and provided the crew of Captain Cook's second voyage to the South Seas with his method so they could drink all they liked. He may have missed the boat on exploiting the commercial potential though, as, as J.J. Sweps soon made a fortune from Percival's formula by setting up a business and selling it as medicine. Of all the inventions we sent to the world, um, this one is probably the most universal and tasty, if not, if not very healthy, and that is flavoured potato crisps, or potato chips as our American cousins call them. They were invented by Joseph Spud Murphy in 1954. Luckily for us, Joseph Spud Murphy had an enormous distaste for playing crisps. It was in the 1950s that saw the introduction of the flavoured potato crisp. Murphy, the founder of Tato, developed a cheese and onion flavoured crisp in 1954, which would prove to be a success both at home and abroad. By the 1960s, Spud had become a millionaire and was described by Sean Lamas, the Minister for Finance at the time, as a very acme of Irish entrepreneurial spirit. Gratefully, we still have manufacturers experimenting with flavours, something that we have Spud Murphy to thank for. Now, a bit more serious than flavouring crisps is modern chemistry. Waterford-born Robert Boyle is regarded as the father of modern chemistry and founder of Boyle's Law, or in other words, how the pressure of gas decreases as its volume increases. His book, The Skeptical Chemist, set in motion a detailed study of chemistry as an academic subject. 
beginning with a group of unrecognisable investigators who called themselves the Invisible College. Boyle wasn't all that enamoured with Ireland, however, when he returned to live here in 1652. He described his homeland in a letter as a barbarous country where chemical spirits were so misunderstood and chemical instruments so unprocurable that it was hard to have any hermetic thoughts in it. Oh, that hurts. The induction coil was invented by a priest no less, Reverend Nicholas Callum in 1836. He was a professor of science at St. Patrick's College, Minute. Reverend Callum was one of Ireland's greatest inventors. For his induction coil, Callum wound two long wires around the end of an electromagnet and connected the ends of the wire to a battery. When he interfered or interrupted the current from the battery, he received a spectacular spark from the end of the second unconnected coil and consequently the induction coil was born. Funny enough, the Reverend managed to knock a future Archbishop of Dublin unconscious while carrying out his tests for his induction coil. Callum's creation, which was over 170 years old, is still used in car ignitions today. Seismology, otherwise known as the science of earthquakes, has an Irish man to credit for his existence, which would seem strange as Ireland is right in the middle of a tectonic plate and probably one of the places on earth least likely to experience an earthquake. Robert Mallet was born in Dublin in 1810 and educated in Trinity College. He graduated at a very young age of 20 with a degree in science and mathematics. After an earthquake devastated Padula in Italy in 1857 causing 11,000 deaths Mallet travelled to the area to record and investigate the damage. The resulting volume, the first principles of observational seismology, is widely regarded as a cornerstone of the subject. Now, for, in the area of communication, perforated stamps. In the early days of the postal system, stamps were printed out in big sheets of paper and had to be individually cut for use. That all changed when Henry Archer came along with his miracle invention, a postage stamp perforation machine, presented in 1848. If you ever wonder why stamps have a wavy outline, Irish-born Archer is the reason. And from sending letters to transatlantic calls. It's a long way from Skype, but it was an Irish man who was knighted for his work in establishing the Atlantic Telegraph Cable in 1865. Lord Kelvin Thompson helped to lay the cable which stretched from Newfoundland to Valencia in County Kerry. He also had a very keen interest in the measurement of temperature and thermodynamics which led to the scale of temperature, the Kelvin scale. Now if you want a little bit more frivolous but nonetheless um, important especially to modern culture where tattoos seem to be um, a universal thing. I think at one stage it would only have been sailors and criminals that would have got themselves tattooed um, in the Western world anyway. But it's fairly universal now. Well, one of the people responsible for the ease with which we can tattoo now was the inventor of the modern tattoo machine, was also an Irish man who lived in New York in 1891. Not much is known about Samuel O'Reilly's early life, but in 1875 he had made a name for himself as a tattoo artist with his own shop at number 11 Chatham Square. His cousin Tom O'Reilly was also a well-known tattoo artist. While future stars such as Charles Wagner also studied at his studio, his rotary tattoo machine was the force to run off electricity and was based on the same technology used by Thomas Edison's autographic printing pen. The basic mechanisms of tattoo machines today are still mostly the same as O'Reilly's original. Rubber soles on your shoes. A young man from Skibbereen in County Cork by the name of Humphrey O'Sullivan is credited with inventing rubber soles for shoes. Humphrey moved to New York when he worked as a printer 
His job involves standing on hard stone floors for long hours. So to ease his aching feet, he bought a rubber mat to stand on. When his fellow employees kept stealing his mat, he cut out some heel-shaped pieces and nailed them to his shoes. He found them to be surprisingly comfortable and the pain in his feet virtually disappeared. So he began making them full-time and selling them to local shoemakers, eventually patenting the idea in 1877 and later making himself inordinately rich as a result. Now one that even surprised me when I found out about it, I have found out about it quite a while ago, but when I did first find out about it, I was surprised that this one came from Ireland, but colour photography. It was invented by John Jolie, who was something of an inventor. He's responsible for quite a few inventions in 1894. Modern day photographers owe a debt of gratitude to a man of Irish Midlands, John Jolie. He was born near the village of Bracken in County Offaly and was an engineering graduate from Trinity College. In 1894, Jolie invented a system of colour photography that was based on taking viewing plates with many narrow lines in three colours. Jolie would mark the viewing plates with tin coloured lines and he would then place the glass in a camera in front of the picture. The photograph would be then taken. This process was much simpler than anything that had come before. It is now widely accepted that he was responsible for the first practical method of colour photography. When you come from a country like Ireland that is almost primarily, other than the main cities of course, outside the main cities, agriculture. The fact that the modern tractor was invented here is probably not so surprising. The mad mechanic Henry Ferguson was responsible for the original Ferguson system of tractor. It was patented by the mad inventor in 1926 and it's the same basic design for a modern tractor that is used today. The County Down man also invented his own motorcycle, race car and plane. And in 1909 he was the first Irishman to fly. Originally a bicycle repairman, he even built himself the first ever four-wheeled Formula One car. His name now lives on in the Massey Ferguson Company. James Bond fans might be surprised to learn that the inventor of the modern ejector seat was an Irishman. While there were previous incarnations of the ejector seat, Martin's invention allowed pilots to eject from planes that travelled at high speeds. In July 1946, the first live test of Martin's ejector seat took place. The test proved to be a success when an explosion blew away the pilot's cockpit and a second explosion propelled the pilot out of the plane that enabled him to parachute to safety. As a result, the RAF reproved Martin's idea and within 12 months the entire RAF fleet had been fitted with ejector seats. It is believed that Martin's invention saved over 5,000 lives by the time of his death in 1981. I wonder how many it saved since then. We're coming to sport um, I'm not dealing with Irish sport, but just one sport in particular. And it's a, it's a sport that will surprise anybody, um, certainly anybody Irish that doesn't know already. And most English people, I reckon this will, su will surprise them. And the sport I'm talking about that was invented in Ireland is croquet. This is usually taught as a quintessentially English game. Croquet, in fact, originated in the west coast of Ireland. The Archbishop of Tuam in County Galway hosted croquet tournaments as far back as the 1830s. By the late 1840s, it had spread nationwide and become popular across the water in Britain by 1852. Its popularity soared among the British gentry and it quickly became a sport synonymous with the upper classes along with polo and tennis. In fact, Wimbledon began as the All England Croquet Club before it transformed into the tennis behemoth we see today. One we're strangely proud of is the extreme budget outlet of pennies, or as our friends in England and other countries will know it as Primark. It's a firm favourite with Irish shoppers. Penny's Primark has established in Ireland for almost 50 years. 
1969, Primark opened its first store in Dublin. Today, it has over 270 stores in nine countries in Europe. More recently, it opened its first store in the US with a flagship store in Boston. Primark has built its reputation on providing the latest fashion at affordable prices. The next stage of expansion we'll see is enter the Italian marketplace with overall revenues expected to be around about 4 billion. We'll finish with a couple of things that aren't objects, but they are social change and one of them actually adding a word to the English lexicon, boycott. The act of deliberately abstaining from using or buying products and services or dealing with certain people or organisations is known as boycotting. It was first invented by some disgruntled Irish villages in Mayo during the land war of the late 19th century, where tenants struggling to gain fair rights to their land, the tenants of the boycott estate protested against meagre reductions in rent and threatened evictions after a poor harvest. Rather than turning to violence, they instead shunned him by refusing to walk in his fields or stables, refusing to deliver his mail and refusing to do any sort of trade with him. After spending thousands on imported workers to harvest his crop, boycott eventually up and left Ireland. So the first peaceful protest against the land and gentry in Ireland worked. We should take from that going forward. And I'll finish by something much more recent and something that we are rather proud of in Ireland. And that is we are the first country to introduce marriage equality by popular vote. I know other countries have reduced it and introduced marriage equality and before us. But because of the way Ireland is set up, such a change needed a change to the constitution. So it needed a referendum. The first so we became a country to introduce it. It was brought about in 2015 when all but one county in Ireland voted to allow an amendment to the constitution allowing for same-sex marriage. Making Ireland, as I say, the first country to legalise gay marriage by popular vote. The result was widely celebrated as a symbol of the future gay rights worldwide while people like the United Nations Secretary General of the time Ban Ki-moon calling it a historic event and a victory for human rights. So it's a nice one to finish on. As I say, it's not an item. It's not something you can eat, you can drink, you can shoot with, you can play with. But it is a major move forward in human rights and one for which I think Irish people are rightly proud. Hi, and um, if you're still here, thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope you permit me a short period of time to tell you about my book. If you like mythology and um, fantasy genre, um, you might be interested in The Chosen. It's the story starts with a young girl out in the forest collecting herbs while the United Irishmen Rebellion is going on in 1798. She comes across a wounded rebel which while she's in the throes of helping him she meets the goddess Breed who grants her the powers of the Tuvade Donnan and the immortality of the Tuvade Donnan. This leads her into a whole new life of adventure where she meets other people who have similar powers from different goddesses like Morrigan and Lou and so on. Um, I thought it was time that Irish mythology was brought into the fantasy genre. Um, Greek mythology has been done as we know and Norse mythology well done as we know and even Egyptian mythology. Um, but the rich Celtic mythology has never been touched on that I know of in a modern context and a modern fantasy context. So um, if that's your particular um, like then uh, check out my book The Chosen and um, there'll be a link in the comments below um, where you can where you can go and get it um, also don't forget to like subscribe and hit the notification button because there's going to be a lot more videos about Dublin Ireland history mythology coming very soon thanks and 
see you again soon.